You're listening to the Mommy Labor Nurse Podcast, episode number 35. Hey guys, happy Monday. We are doing a Q&A today all about the first trimester. So if you just found out you were pregnant, this is going to be a really good episode for you to tune into. I remember when I found out I was pregnant with Walter and when I found out I was pregnant with this baby, um, drastic different uh, reactions, I guess, (laughs) but it's always, it's always a surprise. It's always such a, such a crazy feeling, I feel like, to find out you're pregnant. For some people, obviously, it is a complete surprise and shock and like, what? (laughs) What the heck? And then for others, you know, you're trying and you're not expecting a positive, but you've been trying and it's not as much of a surprise. But I think every mom can agree that it is still a very unique feeling to find out that you're pregnant. So in this episode, I'm going to answer some commonly asked questions that you may have during your first trimester. If this is your first pregnancy, this is probably going to help you out a whole lot more. If you've been pregnant maybe before, this is your second or third or fourth pregnancy, you might know some of the answers to these questions, but still a good episode to tune into if you're still in that first trimester or you just found out. We're going to go over some of the first things that you should do when you find out that you're pregnant, how to calculate your due date, morning sickness, when you should tell your boss, exercise, bleeding, cramping, all of that stuff we're going to go over in this episode. So let's get started. You're listening to the Mommy Labor Nurse Podcast, where we firmly believe in the power of education when it comes to giving birth. Tune in each week as we dive into pregnancy-related topics, expert interviews, and a variety of birth stories. As a reminder, anything you hear on this podcast is not medical advice. Please see mommylabornurse.com slash disclaimer for more details. And now, here's your host, educator, registered nurse, and fellow mom, Liesl Teen. guys, welcome to this episode all about the first trimester. So first of all, congratulations, you're pregnant. Um, Whether you've been trying for a long time and you, you know, have been through the whole trying to conceive journey or you got pregnant on the very first month or this was just a complete surprise, like I said in the intro, seeing that pregnancy test turn positive, those two pink lines is certainly a moment no mother will forget. I think every mom out there can remember the exact scenario of events surrounding, you know, kind of what happened when they found out they were pregnant. For me personally, I think I've told this story before, but with Walter, I found out I was pregnant. I was right before I uh, was going to go into a shift at work. I was I was working night shift at the time, and I wasn't even really expecting you know, a positive. Um, We, that was the first month we had been trying. And I remember I sat down and I took it and I waited, you know, 30 seconds, not even enough time. And it looked like it was negative. So I kind of sat it back down and I got up and I finished going to the bathroom. I washed my hands and I looked down and it was like the tiniest, tiniest little bit of positive. And I was like, Oh my gosh, because at that point, you know, that was my first pregnancy. I'd never had a positive pregnancy test before. I had taken dozens of pregnancy tests before that because I'm just have anxiety, (laughs) right? But I had never seen that second line pop up. So I remember looking at it and being like, oh my gosh, is that, is that actually a second line? And then it started to get stronger. And like I said, it was right before a shift at work. And my husband was actually home at the time, but he was on a conference call. So I was in our master bathroom and he was on a conference call. So I was like, you know what? I, I'm, I got to wait till he gets off the phone. I can't like bust out of this room and be like, I'm pregnant and ruin his conference call. So it was agonizing because it was actually a 45 minute or something conference call. So I was just in there waiting and waiting and waiting for him to get off the phone. And finally he got off. And I came out with like the weirdest look on my face and he was like, what the heck is wrong with you? And I showed him shaking. I remember I was like shaking and he was like, it's 
no, it's it's too light. It, that's not positive. And I was like, no, Brian, that is a pot. Like any kind of line is a positive. And he was like, oh, okay, okay. Didn't quite believe it at first. And then, of course, I worked my shift. I got off in the morning. I went to one of the drugstores and I got one of the digital tests and I got a couple other tests and I took a few more in the morning. And of course, all of them were positive. And then he finally was like wrapping his head around <laughs> the fact that I was pregnant. Um, but yeah, very, very just very unique feeling. With this one, I won't go into quite as much detail. It wasn't as exciting. But again, I guess I we had been trying for a while for, you know, a good like six months. So I had been kind of used to taking pregnancy tests. Um, and so I took that one and I remember I Again, I wasn't expecting it to be positive. I just kind of took it just because I kind of felt a little off. And it was the day before Thanksgiving and Brian wasn't even home. I was just there by myself and I took it and I just, again, like like lime popped up. This one was way darker. I remember that one. I, I didn't take an early pregnancy test this time, but this one was way da- darker. And I just remember like looking at it and being like, oh my oh my God, (laughs) what? And of course, then I called him and he was, I think at his parents' house, he was sleeping over there with Walter because I had to work the next day. I don't know why this always revolves around work, but I had to work the next day at the hospital. So he was sleeping over at his, at my in-laws at his parents' house with Walter. And I called him and I told him, and again, yeah, I was just like, it wasn't like completely surprised because we were trying, but also just just surprised. Like I said, just a very unique feeling to find out that you're pregnant. So enough of my rant <laughs> on when I found out I was pregnant. Um, let's talk about some of these questions that you may have in your first trimester. The first trimester, first of all, I will preface and say, I think for both of these pregnancies was the worst trimester of them all. It does kind of suck at the end when you're in the third trimester and you're big and just, you know, starting to get sore and just, you know, ready to be done. But uh, like the tired fatigue that the first trimester brings and the morning sickness is just awful and you just being so moody and I think it's just your body trying to get used to the fact that you're pregnant so you have these extreme symptoms for me honestly I had morning sickness and I had had a lot of nausea with Walter but with this one I didn't I barely had anything at all but the worst part of it all was the fatigue that I experienced with both of these pregnancies and just I mean you feel like you can't do anything And not to mention, you are also really anxious. A lot of people suffer from anxiety in that first trimester because really the only thing that's telling you that you're pregnant is a little line (laughs) and you might have some symptoms, but a lot of people really suffer from that anxiety of like, uh, am I actually pregnant or, you know, worrying about that you might have a loss. So you kind of feel like crap and you're anxious because you're worried that something might happen or am I really pregnant? And most people kind of keep this a secret, um, at least from the whole entire world in the first trimester. Everybody kind of, you know, tells their pregnancy at different points. But most people, I would say, either keep it under wraps with just their partner or a few close friends or a few close family members in that first trimester Or some people, you know, don't really tell anybody at all. So you kind of feel like crap and you can't really open up to anybody about it. And that can be really depressing for a lot of people. In fact, depression and thoughts of hopelessness, loneliness are the most common in the first trimester, which totally makes sense because you just, you feel like crap, can't talk to anybody about it, except the people who know and maybe a therapist that you have. And at least I felt with my first pregnancy, I knew there was a light at the end of the tunnel. I knew eventually I was going to start feeling better, but I didn't really have any frame of reference. So I was like, this is just 
never ending. And I'm like, when is this going to get better? So yeah, depression is very common. Thoughts of hopelessness are, is very common in that first trimester. All right, so this first question, let's talk about some of the first things that you should do when you find out that you're pregnant. So number one, definitely start taking prenatal vitamins, okay? I just did a post on my Instagram a few days ago last week about prenatal vitamins and what to kind of look for. I really like the ritual vitamins. Those are the ones that I currently take. But everybody is different in which ones that they prefer and kind of what to look for and what nutrients that you that may be more important to you versus, you know, getting this sort of prenatal vitamin with different kind of nutrients. But definitely order some prenatal vitamins. If you've been trying to conceive, you're likely already on prenatal vitamins, so that's cool. Just keep taking them, okay? But if this was a surprise or, you know, maybe maybe you we're trying that first month, but you just hadn't ordered prenatal vitamins yet, go ahead as soon as you find out that you're pregnant and either order some off of Amazon or run to the drugstore and grab some. Another thing that is good for you to do is obviously cut out all of the not so good stuff, right? And there's a lot of foods that you may have heard of that are not safe during pregnancy, like sushi or lunch meat or soft cheeses. Like let's talk about lunch meat for a second. You can still eat lunch meat when you are pregnant. It just needs to be heated to a safe temperature so it kills the the harmful bacteria on there that can make you sick if you are pregnant. So I like to focus more on telling people when they ask, you know, what am I supposed to cut out? I say, okay, definitely cut out this stuff and that is alcohol, tobacco, or any illegal drugs that you are using, because that stuff we know is is dangerous during pregnancy. The foods, you know, can do your own independent research and decide for you after researching and talking to a provider, kind of, you know, what you feel comfortable with, with eating these sorts of foods. I personally still eat sushi, <laughs> okay? I just, I know it's from a reputable place, and I'm not eating like a whole lot of raw, super raw sushi. But one thing that I'm not consuming is alcohol, tobacco, and and any illegal drugs. Not that I was really doing any of that beforehand. A little bit of alcohol here and there, but (laughs) you know. But yeah, if you are currently a smoker, definitely talk to your provider about starting a smoking cessation um, program. If you don't know this, my husband is a smoker. Uh, I've been trying to get him to quit for 11 years now. Um, We're still working on it. (laughs) So I know very well how difficult it is to cut out smoking if you are a smoker. Um, And there are a lot of options available I would advise you to seek out some resources before you just go ahead and try and do it yourself. So definitely talk to your provider. They can give you some excellent advice on that. Depending on how much you smoke, you know, your treatment plan, your cessation program might be a little bit different. But I understand how difficult it can be to quit smoking because I live with someone who smokes quite a lot. (laughs) But yeah, that is very, very important to cut out smoking, cutting out alcohol. You know, once you find out, alcohol is the kind of thing, once you find out you're pregnant, yeah, it is a good idea to cut it out. If for some reason you found out you were pregnant late and you've been, you know, drinking alcohol or smoking cigarettes or doing anything else, you know, generally, okay, you know, it's okay. You can't, obviously you can't go back, right, and cut out alcohol or cigarettes or illegal drugs that you were using before you found out you're pregnant when you were actually pregnant, but we just want to do it as soon as we kind of find out. Alcohol should be completely avoided during pregnancy um, at any just, you know, at any week, at any gestation. Really, the fact is there's no known safe amount of alcohol during any stage of pregnancy. They've never really done really great studies on this, and they probably will not ever. So that is the general general recommendation. And this goes for any type of alcohol, so beer, wine, or liquor. All right, the next thing you should do when you find out you're pregnant is tell your partner, <laughs> okay? Obviously, um, 
everyone is kind of different, like I said before, in when they tell their loved ones or certain loved ones, certain family or friends. But someone that definitely deserves to know is the uh, other person on the end, (laughs) who is the other party of this pregnancy. Everybody's kind of different in terms of how they tell their partners. Some people uh, just do it kind of Uh, boring like I did (laughs) where I just kind of called him or I told him some people do it in really creative ways and I think that's really cool and hey go for it if that's you but yeah that's that certainly needs to be done is uh, telling uh telling the other person the next thing you should do is schedule your first prenatal appointment okay some people think that they should find out they're pregnant and then not schedule an appointment for a what like not call a provider or anything for a while um but that's actually not true as soon as you kind of find out you're pregnant you know if if it's on a weekend you wait to the to the week okay to call your provider um but kind of that first day that you find out you're pregnant it's appropriate to call your provider and let them know we're going to get into more detail of the first visit and kind of what that entails later on. But that is certainly something that you should at least do is call your provider and let them know because they may want you to come in sooner rather than later. Sometimes they want you to come in immediately and get some blood drawn. Sometimes they want you to come in at six or eight weeks of pregnancy for an ultrasound, for a confirmation ultrasound, and some providers don't see you until 10, 11, 12 weeks of pregnancy. It all kind of depends on your provider, but it's always a good idea to at least call and schedule that appointment when you first find out so you get, you know, on their schedule and you establish care. Another reason it's good to do this initially is because if you do have any symptoms like severe you know, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, you know, lots of bleeding or cramping, or you, you know, need to call your provider. They already have it in your, in their system that you're pregnant, that you've already established care with them. And it's a, it's a much easier process to call them and ask them questions. All right. Two more things that you should do when you first find out you're pregnant. Avoid stuff activities uh, that could cause any injury to your belly, okay? Even though you are in the first trimester, it's still a good idea to cut out any contact sports, okay? If you are, you know, someone that plays or, or, you know, does a lot of contact sports, it's a good idea to kind of stop doing these, okay? So like horseback riding, skiing, Uh, trampolines, okay, roller coasters, rollerblading, skateboarding, all of this stuff. It's also a good idea to go ahead and start avoiding any, uh, like being in a sauna or being in a hot tub, even in the first trimester. And that is not a safe activity to do at all during pregnancy because it can raise your body, your internal body temperature pretty high, which can be dangerous. And you also, some people also have the tendency to get dizzy if they're in a hot, uh, a hot tub or a sauna for a long extended period of time. And you are more likely to experience this dizziness and blood pressure changes if you're pregnant. Okay. So make sure you do that too. All right. And finally, The last thing you should do is download all the fun apps that come with pregnancy. Start ordering some books, okay? You know, what to expect books and pregnancy books and apps. I have a few different apps downloaded on my phone. Let me pull my phone up right now and tell you which ones I have. I have the Ovia Pregnancy app. I have Glow Nurture. I have an app called Pregnancy Plus. Then I have a couple other apps, but I like those the best. There's a bunch of different pregnancy tracking apps out there and everybody kind of likes the likes a different one, but I like those. I also really like the Juna app, but that's an exercise app in addition to like a pregnancy uh, tracking app. But yeah, that's a fun little activity and a fun little thing to look at every day or every other day. They give you tips and tricks of what to expect, you know, in this stage of pregnancy and they're just fun. So I definitely encourage people to to download all those fun little apps. All right, next up, how do you calculate your due date? Okay, and will it change? Probably the easiest way is to just Google how calculating due date and go to a website like whattoexpect.com or 
one of these other websites where they have a little calculator that it's really easy and you just put in your missed period um, or your if you know your at you know your ovulation date most people don't know that but most people do know their last missed period and you just put it in there and it gives you a little calculation of when you're due another way to do it manually okay is to subtract so take your last missed period that you had and subtract three months okay from the first day of your last period so if you got your period so mine i'll say was uh november was it november 1st we'll say november 1st okay it was my last missed period so you subtract three months from the first day of your last period and then you add seven days okay so plus seven days so my date due date would be november 1st minus three months is october september august okay and then you add seven days so you have to you have to account if it's a leap year, which it is. So mine was August 7th, which is only six days. But, nor you know, in a normal year, you would add then seven days. But if you're confused, you know, just go to one of those uh, websites and put in your last missed period and they'll tell you. But that's how you do it manually. So will it change? Uh, it may change. And if you're not quite sure when your last period was or if you have irregular periods, your due date may change a little bit from like a typical due date that you might, you know, g calculate from Google. If you have an early pregnancy scan, like a six or six to eight week scan, that is gonna be the most accurate indicator of when your due date is based on your last missed period. So if they say your last missed period Cor you know, correlates with this first ultrasound plus or minus a few days, then they're probably going to go with your last missed period that date. But if it's off more than, I think four, it depends on the provider and the practice, but if it's off more than like four or five days, more than a week, some people come in and they're like, oh, I'm uh, four weeks more pregnant than I thought I was. <laughs> and they're just calculating uh, their last missed period from bleeding that they may have had in the first trimester instead of actually a cycle. So that may be a reason why your due date changes. As you go through your pregnancy, sometimes your due date may change as well, depending on ultrasound or depending on how you're measuring. This is less common. and They really like to stick with that first, that first ultrasound and your last missed period because that first ultrasound is the most accurate. As we get later and later in pregnancies, these ultrasounds become less and less accurate. But if you're tracking way, way off, you know, one way or the other, your provider may, you know, analyze and look at everything and say, mm, maybe your dating is actually off. All right, next question is about symptoms. Okay, so what are the common symptoms that I may experience in the first trimester? Gosh, there are a good bit. <laughs> and we'll go over the main ones. And then we'll talk about morning sickness in extent, because that is the that is one of the main ones that many moms face. But let's talk about some of the some of the symptoms. So one of the main ones that I certainly experience and most moms experience is that first trimester fatigue. You just feel like you got hit by a truck and you can't do anything. And anything that you do kind of makes you tired. You have to sleep a lot more at night and take naps during the day and stop if you you know get really winded. You just you're just tired all the time. That's very common and that does that does usually resolve in the second trimester. For me, both, you know, both times it was about 13, 14 weeks I started to kind of get my energy back. But gosh, that is certainly a very real symptom that that, you know, most moms do face that they're just overwhelmingly tired. Another few common symptoms that you may have in the first trimester are you might just feel like your breasts are really tender. You might kind of feel moody, um, kind of like extreme PMS. That's the best way to uh, describe it. 
you may have increased urination, okay? So you're going to the bathroom more in that first trimester because your kidneys are starting to work a little bit harder. That's very common that we see. That usually is about six, six or seven weeks you start to experience that. You may start to have some food cravings or aversions. You know, you really, really want something all of a sudden or you like, you know, are sick to your stomach by looking at meat or onions or garlic or coffee or, you know, something odd. You might start to have some of these odd aversions that pregnant women experience. Heartburn is even common in that first trimester. As you get more and more pregnant, you may experience heartburn more and more, but it still certainly can happen in the first trimester as well. And then another big one that a lot of people face in the first trimester is constipation, unfortunately. And that is just not only due to kind of the changes that your body goes through during pregnancy, but if you have been incorporating a prenatal vitamin with some iron in it and you're not used to taking extra iron, this can make you constipated as well. So it's very important to try and stay as hydrated as you can. You can take colace, you know, is safe, a stool softener, try to get some fibrous foods in your diet. Giving yourself enough time to go to the bathroom is very important. Prunes. I love, uh, I, I still eat prunes (laughs) because I still experience constipation from time to time during this pregnancy. Um, But yeah, it can be a little bit more extreme in that first trimester. And then finally, the big one is morning sickness. And why do we even call it morning sickness anymore? Because it can just uh, happen all day, every day and at night (laughs) and whenever, right? Some moms experience sickness um, kind of immediately, uh, you know, as soon as that little baby latches on to uh, your uterus, you start to not feel so great, <laughs> okay, and feel really nauseous. And then some moms, it kind of starts happening about six weeks. It, it, I remember I did have a little bit of nausea with this pregnancy, and It was about right at about six weeks and it lasted for a weekend. I felt I was like, oh, crap, (laughs) I'm going to I'm going to feel like this for, you know, until I'm 13 or 14 weeks. But for me, it just, you know, kind of lasted that weekend. And then every once in a while, I would have a little bit of nausea kind of like after I ate or if I ate certain foods. But I was blessed and lucky that I didn't have a lot of sickness with this pregnancy, but I certainly did with Walter. Some of the things that helped me were lemons, lemonade, the tartness of the lemon um, for a lot of people can alleviate those symptoms. And lemon is also considered to be an anti-inflammatory in your intestines. So that's why it works for a lot of people. Ginger. Okay. A lot of people know about ginger and the benefits that a ginger can have for your GI system. I like to steer people away from excessive amounts of ginger ale because a lot of those ginger ale brands just have like a lot of sugar. If you're getting ginger ale, um, you know, try to get a brand that has like actual real ginger in it and isn't super, super high in sugar um, because that, you know, that can make you even more nauseous. But ginger ale is good if it's, you know, good ginger ale. Ginger snaps, those little ginger snap cookies. Uh, that they even have the pills, okay, that just have pure, it's just a capsule with like a little bit of ginger powder in it, super safe. And then they also have like little ginger candies, uh, little ginger, I know Altoid makes like a ginger mint. And some people just like chewing on straight ginger, like, you know, you just get a ginger, a ginger root from the grocery store and you just kind of chew on it, suck on it, and that helps. Another helpful tip is starting to take your prenatal vitamin at night. If you have a lot of sickness, especially in the morning, uh, sometimes that prenatal vitamin swallowing a pill with like a, you know, big swig of water can, can make you kind of nauseous. So if you switch to taking your prenatal, prenatal vitamin at night, that may help a little bit with some of the sickness or vice versa. So if you're taking it at night and maybe you're experiencing more of your sickness at night, maybe try taking it during the day or taking it at it at a different day, different time of day or with a meal. Some women are completely disgusted at the idea of meat uh, during the first trimester, but protein, especially like frequent high protein meals, 
can help keep that nausea really at bay. It's a known fact that vitamin B6, okay, can help decrease the symptoms of nausea and vomiting during pregnancy. So guess what uh, B6 is very prevalent in is foods that are very rich in protein like chicken, turkey, nuts, chickpeas, legumes, all of that good stuff. And vitamin B6 is one of those remedies that a lot of providers will actually prescribe. In addition to your prenatal vitamin, they might uh, say, okay, here's an extra dose of vitamin B6 because we know that it can help with, with nausea and vomiting. But if you're just kind of eating the foods, eating very high, you know, high protein meals throughout the day, that can do, you know, just the same thing. Another tip is having some crackers right next to your bed and eating them right before you wake up in the morning. Okay, or sorry, (laughs) right before you get out of bed. You can't eat uh, before you wake up, (laughs) but right before you get out of bed, have a little pack of saltine crackers right there or Triscuits or, you know, it's very... um, salty (laughs) crackers next to your bed and eat them kind of before you even get out of bed. It helps because you aren't moving at all and you get something immediately on your stomach. Saltines, I think, honestly, are the best because they they have that salt in there and it just, you know, they they just, I think they help initially in the morning to really combat that, that queasy feeling you have you know, right when you wake up and you're brushing your teeth and you're, you know, you start to really feel the symptoms. But I really like that tip. And I, I personally did that certainly with Walter all the time. I would just have crackers right, right next to my bed and pop one, you know, before I got out of bed. I also kept them in my purse too for later in the day. If I started to feel a wave of nausea, I would try to eat a little saltine. And that honestly made a huge difference. There are other tips and tricks out there that you can try. Other products out there, like I have a friend who really like those morning sickness acupuncture bands, um, and there are just various products that you can try to combat your nausea. But most importantly, I do always like to tell people that if your nausea and vomiting is extreme to the point of where you can't keep any liquid down at all, like you're throwing up nonstop, definitely give your provider a call, okay? Because that is not normal. That may be something called hyperemesis and it may require some treatment and an assessment by your provider. So if you are really, you know, having that much nausea nausea and vomiting, definitely give your provider a call because it might be that. And, you know, you have a tendency to get very dehydrated very quickly when you're pregnant. So it's important to always, always follow up with your provider if that is you. All right, let's talk about work and when you should kind of tell your boss when you are pregnant and you know, does your work environment pose any risk to your pregnancy? So the answer to that question obviously depends on where you work, okay? We already talked about like contact uh, sports and contact activities. So if you have a job where you're, where you have a lot of physical contact with, you know, where you're getting hit or (laughs) punched or something in your, in your abdomen, like, I don't know, maybe you're a karate teacher or something. (laughs) It's important to uh, let people know that you're pregnant because you kind of have to scale back and do some different things. Another main one is if you work in the healthcare um, field, you may have to tell your boss a little bit earlier than you'd like because there are certain types of patients Uh, ding, 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 coronavirus going on right now. We kind of want to have pregnant people stay away from coronavirus patients. There are also a few other types of patients, like patients who are positive for tuberculosis that you don't want to be taken care of. Even if you're not a nurse, um, if you're a respiratory therapist, or if you are um, an x-ray technician and really want to protect our belly, Um, when you do x-rays, but if you're an x-ray technician or a respiratory therapist or a tech or, you know, you work in EVS, you you know, you're cleaning rooms, any sort of like healthcare related job like that, you kind of want to want to let your boss know so they can not, you know, avoid certain patients in certain rooms. 
Also, if you have a job where you are doing a lot, a lot of physical activity, like you're lifting a whole lot, you're moving really, really heavy stuff, you may want to tell your boss sooner rather than later because sometimes, especially if you have a high risk pregnancy coming in um, and they already know that you're going to be high risk during your pregnancy, you may have to have some adjustments. There are certain other jobs too, like if you work with a lot of chemicals that aren't safe during pregnancy, it's a good a good idea to let someone know if you find out that you're pregnant because you, you know you may need to be offered different work. Overall, if you work in an environment though that is like an office environment, you know that's you know that's perfectly safe during during first trimester, second trimester, third trimester. It's really those activities and any like chemical exposure, virus, expo- you know, certain virus exposures that we need to kind of be wary of. And you may need to tell your boss a little bit sooner rather than later. But if you are pregnant and you don't have one of those jobs and you just have, you know, normal like office job, most people tell their boss um, around the 12, 13 week mark. Um, you may, you know, you may wait a little bit longer than that, but that's generally when most people open up and tell their boss. And it's, it's important to, in some industries, especially if you work for a really small company that you tell your boss around this time frame because they may really have to prep for your maternity leave and it may take months for them to prep for your maternity leave. In certain industries, it may be different. You know, you just tell your boss that you're pregnant and it's like, okay, no big deal. This is how maternity leave works and all of this. Especially if you work for a small company, it's always good to let them know that, hey, like, I'm, you know, I'm pregnant. <laughs> I'm going to be taking maternity leave at this point. So they can, you know, adjust, adjust things accordingly. All right, so next question is, can you continue to exercise, okay? Again, I'm gonna, I don't know why, I I keep bringing up uh, contact sports, but if you are exercising uh, through the use of contact sports, no, we don't wanna continue to to be doing those activities, but in general, most exercises are actually safe during pregnancy, okay, if you were doing them before. So if you were an avid runner or if you were an avid gym goer, okay, and you're still, you know, you're lifting weights, basically, you know, you can, you can keep doing all of these activities as long as you aren't having any symptoms, okay? So if you were a runner, let's use running as an example. If you were a runner and you find out you're pregnant and you keep running and then, uh, you know what, I'm finding that I'm getting a lot more winded or I'm having to stop a whole lot or I'm getting dizzy and I need to sit down through my runs, then it's not such a good idea to continue that activity. But if you are not having any symptoms and you have been exercising before your pregnancy, it is perfectly safe in most instances to keep exercising. Obviously, this is the kind of thing that you do want to run. You know, we have to provide a disclaimer. You do want to run by any exercise during your pregnancy with your provider. But most providers agree that if you have no symptoms and you have been exercising, doing the same sorts of exercises beforehand you can certainly continue and it's going to be in your best benefit that you continue even in that first trimester. Um, Exercise can be so, so beneficial for that fatigue that you experience, even though sometimes some days exercise is the last thing that you want to do. Um, (laughs) But it can really, I remember the days the days that I could drag my butt up and start exercising, it did make a huge difference in my fatigue in that first trimester. And another thing that it helps too with is uh, nausea and vomiting and morning sickness. So yeah, big fan of continuing exercise during pregnancy. All right, next question. We have two more questions that we're gonna, gonna go over. The next one is about the first prenatal visit, okay? Um, so usually that first prenatal visit, it's going to depend on your provider and your situation and your health history, but typically most providers nowadays want to see moms at least for a confirmation around six to eight weeks, okay, of pregnancy, and then they want to see you again at about 10, between 10 and 12 weeks. So that first prenatal visit 
is usually not going to be as long as that second one. That first one, you're probably going to go in and they'll get all your information from you and they'll do a dating ultrasound to date the pregnancy and see exactly how, you, how pregnant you are just to make sure, you know, kind of aligns with, with your period. Some providers do do that whole intake and this is a longer appointment at six to eight weeks. Um, my OB does it where it's like a shorter appointment. They just confirm your pregnancy and then they do like a longer appointment at 10 to 12 weeks. We'll kind of talk about like those two appointments as it as if it were one, okay, and kind of what to expect. So first of all, how do you prepare, okay? So you want to make sure you I mean, most people know their medical history, but you want to make sure you gather all of that information. And, you know, if they ask you questions about family members, you want to make sure you know, you know, oh, you know, oh, mom, do you have this type of medical issue or this type of medical issue? Because they will want to know a lot of this sort of stuff because they want to know it for screening purposes. They want to know about immunizations that you've had, if you're up to date on your vaccinations, if you've had any um, major illnesses or surgeries, they want to know about all of that. So make sure you have all of that information available. Your mental health history, okay, and any medications that you take, make sure that you know the dosages of that, of those, and what the names are. If this is a brand new practice that you're going to, and they don't have any of your gynecological history or obstetrical history, then make sure you have that per, that information available as well. So if you've had a previous pregnancy, let's say, you know, you moved or something, you want to make sure you know that, oh, you, you know, you, you know to tell them, oh, hey, I, I bled a whole lot after I gave birth, you know, the first time, or I had this issue during my pregnancy, you know, the first time or whatever. And then once you get there, okay, like I said, you'll have an ultrasound to confirm the pregnancy and date the pregnancy. You'll get a checkup, an assessment, so your provider will check your heart and your lungs and your belly and your breasts. They may do a pelvic exam, okay? Some providers don't. Most providers do do that at that first exam, but some providers don't. They'll get a urine sample, okay, just also to confirm that you're pregnant. And then you'll get a lot of blood work done as well to check what blood type you are, check for anemia, check for certain antibody titers, um, check for certain immunities, like if, you, if you're immune to a disease called rubella or if you're immune to chicken pox. And some providers even do a full panel, a full electrolyte panel um, to see if you're deficient in any electrolytes too. This may be the appointment too that they ask you about genetic screenings. I did have a podcast that I did with Marta Perez a, a few episodes ago where we went, in, went into more detail about genetic screenings and why they do them and what that kind of entails. So definitely go back and listen to that episode. That was episode 29 with Dr. Perez and we talked about some genetic screenings. So if you are going in for your first prenatal visit, and interested in that genetic screening, or if you need that genetic screening, this is usually when they'll do it. You'll also get tested for any STDs, okay? They usually screen pretty much everybody for this. And then they'll give you, you know, your official due date, okay? Most people, like I said, they'll Google it beforehand, so you, so you probably know kind of when your due date is, but they'll calculate everything and you'll get your official due date. And then, of course, they will talk to you about um, any questions that you have. I usually, what I do it, all the time, okay, whenever I go to a prenatal visit, is I just kind of have a note open on my iPhone and I jot down any questions that I think of. So you'll get the chance, you know, to interview your provider and talk to them about any questions that you have as well. All right, and then the last question is, when should I call my provider and bleeding or cramping normal kind of when you know when do I call okay like if I'm experiencing any of these like weird symptoms during the first trimester so even if you have not had that first visit and established care in that way where you've actually fit you know physically gone to see your doctor or your midwife definitely still always it's always okay to call your provider if you are concerned about any sort of symptom during pregnancy okay regardless of the ones that I bring up but definitely any bleeding okay bleeding and cramping can be normal during the first 
trimester and it can be common during the first trimester, but it's always a good idea to call your provider if you experience any of this so they can track it, write it down and assess it, okay? If you're having heavy, heavy bleeding or heavy, heavy cramping, that is obviously certainly more worrisome and they'll probably have you come in for that. But even if you're having some spotting or you're having kind of light cramping, that can be normal, but it's always a good idea to let your provider know about this because they can ask you kind of more questions, um, kind of get to the bottom of maybe why you're feeling that way. But yeah, definitely any bleeding or cramping you want to call. I already mentioned it before, but if you're having extreme, extreme, um, not constipation, (laughs) extreme, extreme diarrhea or vomiting during your pregnancy where you can't keep any liquids down, definitely give your provider a call about this because you do have a tendency to get very, very dehydrated very quickly. Another one to call about is a fever, okay, or any signs of infection. So a fever, especially higher than 100.4, you want to make sure you call, call your provider about that. Because infections and high fevers can be dangerous, especially in that first trimester. If you passed out, okay, you lost consciousness, um, definitely call your provider about that. They want to come in and see about that. And then it's still definitely okay to call your provider if you have some like unusual vaginal discharge or smell down there because that can indicate an infection as well and that needs to be checked out. Headaches can be common in the first trimester as well, but we do want to tell a provider about a very, very severe headache, especially if it's accompanied by um, visual changes. Okay, so that's important to call about as well. Really anything where you're like, I just, I don't feel right. I I feel like I need to be seen by a provider. Always okay to call your provider. (laughs) If you have a good provider, they will have no problem with taking your call and, you know, answering your questions and having you come in to be seen if needed. All right, that is it for this episode, all about the first trimester. Um, If you're still in the first trimester and you're listening to this, there is light at the end of the tunnel, okay? I just want to make that clear that eventually you're, you know, you're going to get to that second trimester where life is good, okay? And you have more energy and you're like starting to feel some baby kicks, but hang in there. It's coming, okay? All right, guys, I will see you same time, same place next week. Are you looking for birth education? Did you know that I have two fabulous birth courses that are super affordable? Well, I do. Head over to mommylabornurse.com slash podcast to take a short quiz to see which birth class is for you. When you purchase either birth course, you'll have full access to it forever. And that means it will never expire and you can access it throughout any stage of your pregnancy or for any subsequent pregnancies that you have. You'll also gain free access to my Facebook group, linked to the class where you can ask questions about your pregnancy, share your birth story after you give birth, read other people's birth stories, and get to know other members who are in the course. There is also a money back guarantee, so if you are at all unsatisfied with your purchase, please, please send me an email at hello at mommylaborers.com for a full refund. There's really no risk to signing up, and I promise you will learn a ton about what's to come when you give birth. As a listener of this podcast, you automatically get 20% off any purchase if you use the code PODCASTLISTENER. I've had tons of moms just like you enter these birth courses and have fabulous, wonderful, empowering births because they feel so much more educated about what's to happen. So if you are at all curious about birth education, again, I encourage you to go to mommylabornurse.com slash podcast and use the code podcastlistener to save 20%. All right, so that is it for this episode of the Mommy Labor Nurse Podcast. You probably follow me on Instagram because that's probably where you came from. But if you don't, head over to Instagram and follow me at mommy.labornurse for more. That is certainly where I am most active. I also now have a separate Instagram for just this podcast, so I encourage you to follow my second account at mommylabornurse.podcast as well if you want podcast updates. Again, that is at mommylabornurse.podcast. 
As always, you guys know that I also have a website where I have tons of articles all about pregnancy, birth, breastfeeding, newborn stuff, and more at www.mommylabornurse.com. I want to hear more from you on how much you love this episode of the podcast or how you think I can improve. So leave me a comment on one of my pictures, send me a DM, or send me an email with all the love. All right, guys, I will see you same time, same place next week.